For us, we are a crypto hedge fund. We are specifically looking for assets that are uniquely enabled by blockchain. Um, so they need to be either decentralized in some way or they need to be permissionless or trustless. Um, we're looking, f we're not a really focused on kind of securities tokens. I mean, the traditional assets that are going to be securitized um, is great for global liquidity and price discovery, um, but that's not uniquely enabling any sort of new business models. Um, within that, you know, we really look for, pride ourselves on fundamental analysis and research. Um, we're really approaching the space on a first principles basis, trying to understand, you know, what the protocol does, you know, why is it helpful, what are the design trade-offs that it's making in the, in the space, uh, how is it attracting an ecosystem and developing, and then, you know, what does the token look like? Is the token even necessary? Um, is the token going to accrue value, or is this going to be kind of a tragedy of the commons with regards to a protocol that's very useful, but the underlying token itself doesn't actually accrue value? Um, so that's what we're really looking at. Um, you know, we think there's uh, very strong assets in, that are publicly kind of listed and have liquidity. We think liquidity is, a, is kind of a game changer when it comes to venture style investing. Um, and so, you know, we try and balance our portfolio mostly with um, liquidity. Uh, it allows us to do different things like uh, uh, concent portfolio concentration that I think traditional VCs don't have the, the you know, a availability to do. Uh, it also gives us the opportunity to change our mind and reallocate capital to the assets we have the most conviction in. Um, in addition to that, you know, we do take a venture capital style approach. We've got you know, a small portion of our portfolio where we work directly with developer teams to try and add value where we can, put teams together, introduce them to the right people, help them with their token economics, um, and then look for you know, a liquidity event within kind of 12 months. That's kind of our strategy. Well, we have never equated blockchain with um, just Bitcoin or uh, crypto assets. Um, when I, uh, my first introduction to, to the blockchain sector was going to my first Bitcoin conference, and then uh, very quickly I just learned about the underlying technology, and, and um, I invested through the early days of the internet in the mid and late 90s. And to me, this was kind of the next stage um, in terms of infrastructure build out, new business models. Um, you know, instead of going through uh, gatekeepers or servers, you know, we could now really connect on a more peer-to-peer -peer basis. So, um, with with the first fund, which we invested from 2014 to um, uh, 2017, I, I looked at the sector two different ways. One was uh, creating more efficiencies in developed markets, so in the financial services sector um, uh, and, and uh, healthcare and, and, and um, established industries. And then um, I also have an emerging market background. So I looked at what new businesses, new business models can be enabled in, in some of these markets. And then in some ways, that's even more interesting to me than the efficiencies. And I think that's where we'll start to see some of the truly decentralized models start to emerge. Um, and, and so I, I view it as, you know, we still have infrastructure building, we'll have middleware, and we'll have applications. And, uh, you know, the, the convergence of those three layers may happen quicker and, and may happen at the same time, but we're still going to have build out in, in all three layers. Yes, yeah, so I think for us, um, Grayscale Investments, we're an asset management business, so we're helping people to gain exposure to digital currencies through the purchase of a security. Think of our products very much the same way that things like GLD and other products allow people to access things like gold or certain sectors of the market. And so the approach that we have is around liquid tokens. Um, but as mentioned in, in my intro, Grayscale is part of a conglomerate called Digital Currency Group, um, which is probably the most prolific and active venture capitalist in the space. And so our VC side of our business, which often co-invests with Jalak, um, there is quite a bit of overlap, but I think for us, the, the places where we're deploying capital, which now I think spans 115 unique companies in almost 30 countries around the world, is really investing in the picks and the shovels of this ecosystem. And so we're investing primarily in exchanges and wallets, um, identity management solutions, trading software, et cetera. Um, it's our view that when someone's saying, what does investing in blockchain mean? There's a lot of different approaches to it. Um, you know, 
one way is to buy tokens directly um, or buy tokens that power these blockchain technologies and believing that the scarce ones are going to be the fuel that powers the utility of the blockchains on which they reside and that there's some kind of balance between the two and hence some value created there. Other folks are taking the perspective that they need to be investing in companies, um, and so we're doing a little bit of both. Um, the issue with investing in early stage companies, um, as I'm sure you remember from investing in the mid to late 90s, is a lot of things don't happen the way you think they're going to. Um, and that's why we've spread out um, you know, our investments across so many different com companies and so many different countries. Um, but I think you know, from a VC perspective, that's also why investing in the space is exceedingly risky, as venture capital tends to be, but also really exciting. Um, and so as time goes on, you know, some great things emerged out of the internet bubble, right? You have Google, Amazon, all these great firms. And so can we see that happening in the broadly defined blockchain ecosystem? Absolutely. You'll see consolidation. We're already starting to see a lot of companies go through acquisitions, start talking about IPOs, et cetera. Um, but it is still a very nascent ecosystem as a whole. So um, opportunities abound, but lots of risks at the same time. Yeah, and I, I would just add, I mean, uh, you know, if, you, if you're a VC, you know how to do VC, right? <laughs> totally. And, and so, what, I mean, anytime there is, um, you know, bubbly or frothy activity, you have people getting into the sector who aren't as um, comfortable with the asset class. I mean, to me, you know, investing in some of these companies, you know, uh, first 600,000 into blockchain, which is the largest crypto wallet in the world right now, um, that was less risky to me than investing in Uber at like a 70 or $80 billion valuation. So I, I think it's really, you know, comfort level on, on and, and we still need patient capital. I mean, we've seen a lot of companies raise a lot of money and not deliver product. Um, so while technology and money may be available, I think scaling and the human capital piece of it is, is still, um, you know, still needs to be managed. Yeah, that's, that's a great sort of bigger picture of you. I'm going to shift a bit and put you on the spot a little bit, Jalak, and I'm going to do the same to you guys too. But just a report of the critiques you sometimes hear the different investors out there. And in the case of the VCs, I know the blockchain evangelists are like, VCs are now irrelevant. Web 3.0, we've you know, decentralized finance token and also I think this is true VCs were late to this game the real Most blockchain were, believers yeah. were there yeah. so uh, you know are you gonna be irrelevant or VCs in trouble <laughs> um, I I'm excited about this you know I bring on and bring on the competition I think there are a lot of VCs that don't add value um, who've you know, who've just gotten away with just putting money into companies and not fulfilling their, especially at the early stage, obligations. You know, what I view as part of the job is if someone's going to give up equity, I'm going to add value in addition to the money. Um, and, and that's always the way I've invested, which is why each portfolio only has 25 companies. We invest uh, with after diligence, spending time with the entrepreneur with conviction, and then we help you know, bring our network to bear. Um, and that's what I think VC should be about. So if it means that entrepreneurs have choices to not take VC money and go to alternative sources, I'm fine with that. Um, I just want to see the greatest entrepreneurs and, and business models proliferate, and I think there is a role in VC for that. And have you made any bets recently that you're particularly proud of or you think have worked out well? Well, I'm, I'm actually I mean, we have an 80% follow-on rate in our portfolio versus like a less than 20% with a standard. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of great companies in our, our portfolio. Everledger is one that I'm particularly excited about. Um, just built a permission uh, uh, blockchain for the diamond industry and is moving to other um, high, uh, high value assets. Um, and it touches you know, insurance, verification, as well as things like making sure conflict diamonds are out of the, um, uh, the supply chain. Um, and, and I'm also, so with the second fund, uh, most of our investments have not yet been announced, but I'm looking very closely at kind of the infrastructure and, and trading of crypto assets and, and providing more liquidity or better user interfaces or better security. Makes sense. And Matt, I'm going to put you on the hot seat for a little bit, just in terms of uh, from the hedge fund world. A lot of... Uh, a lot of hedge funds went into crypto, all rushed in in 2017. There's been reports recently it's been a bit crowded and some of the weak and the sick are kind of exiting. Um, and also hedge funds generally are under sort of some strain and skepticism. Are you confident you're going to be able to sort of prevail in this somewhat choppy waters? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I think if you look at some of the numbers, it's like 250 different, you know, crypto hedge funds. I think when, when you really parse through it, you know, a lot of them are, you know, mom and pop type shops, people who are, you know, 
former engineers that are smart um, that you know thought that they could kind of raise a fund. I think people are starting to quickly realize, given the market environment, that it wasn't so much a vic they were kind of victims of their own success. It wasn't really them that was driving the value in the alpha there. It was just beta exposure, and they just bought in at the right time and they wrote it to the top. I think there's very few funds that have uh, real size, like above, I would say, even $30 million of, of, of external capital. Um, and I think that, you know, if you don't have a differentiated strategy and you really aren't approaching it from a first principles basis and trying to understand you know, what you're investing in and how it works and really how the ecosystem evolves and is defined and really being kind of a leader in that space and driving the conversation um, on a more fundamental level, then I think you're kind of gonna get eaten up around people who come into the space that have more expertise than you or you're gonna fall away on, on kind of your thoughts uh, which, which aren't necessarily you know, where the industry is going. I think it could be, a, some people have a, more of a myopic view. I think, you know, we're, the way that we're building it is, is very much fundamental, you know, based. I think we're trying to do it in the right way and back, you know, the right teams and, and be really selective with the, with the, the developers that, that we like to work with. Um, and also, you know, being, you know, have strong fiduciary to our, to our investors and, and managing our portfolio. And are you able to describe any sort of successful bets you've met? I know a lot of this is going to be confidential, but just sort of take us under the hood a little bit, something you've done that's worked out. Um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, I'm not, you know, ethically, I don't, you know, want to show our portfolio, if, if you will. I think there's, you know, a lot of that that goes on. It's not something that, that we try and do. Um, and most of our portfolio is is liquid, and so that that's that's a risk. But I think, you know, Thinking probabilistically about our portfolio is something that we do from a risk management perspective, and we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, really crazy risks that are frankly, you know, really never going to happen. Um, but if there's a non-zero probability of, of that occurring, we're thinking about it, and so we try and, you know, position our portfolio in a way where, if that exogenous risk were to happen, you know, where would we want to be positioned? Would we want to hold more cash? Would we want to hold a defensive asset? Is there a hedge against um, risk? So, you know, there was there was an opportunity where. Uh, you know, we think decentralized exchanges are really interesting, and there's a handful of different tokens out there. Um, you know, we owned one, we had a lot of conviction in it, and one of the hedges was, look, we think there's a real risk that centralized exchanges are going to get hacked. Like, frankly, they are. And no matter how many times you tell people not to leave your coins on a centralized exchange, like, people will leave their coins on a centralized exchange. Like, we're, you know, habits of, creatures of habit and convenience. And so, you know, we think that's a valid risk moving forward. And so, in that sort of instance, you know, maybe we want to hold a decentralized, you know, exchange asset or protocol so that, token at least, so that we can, you know, get that bump when people realize, hey, this exchange got hacked and people will move more over to decentralized <laughs> exchanges and that increases the value of the token due to you know, potential utility in the future. So that's, that's kind of an example of how we think at least probabilistically about risk management. Oh, interesting. And Michael, I guess my special question for you, it's uh, sort of hard to figure out how to put you on the hot seat because DCG is everywhere and doing so well. But that's actually what occurred to me talking before we began about consensus, big conference in New York, gets bigger and bigger every year. So it looks like you guys are raking in, raking in gobs of money you have the media wing, you own lots of Bitcoin, you have, it seems, everything. And is there a point where it gets too big? Are you almost a conglomerate now? And does that ever undercut your ability to sort of invest shrewdly? Or do you find yourself conflicted because you have so many investments? Yes, yeah, so I think for us, um, our CEO, Barry Silbert, is a serial entrepreneur, um, has learned a lot of lessons along the way with a lot of the businesses that he's run. Um, the last business where I originally joined him was called Second Market. We were a New York City-based broker-dealer that was trading private company stock, things like Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera, which we exited um, and sold to NASDAQ uh, a couple years ago. And so I think as Barry has kind of you know, created businesses, sold businesses, um, done a lot of personal investing, a lot of professional investing, He's learned a lot of lessons along the way, one of which is to stay really lean and really mean. And so across the DCG organization now, um, even with the three subsidiary businesses, Coindesk, Genesis, and Grayscale, um, we're still less than 50 people. Um, and uh, you know, I think we're just trying to navigate, at the moment, some choppy waters. Um, so we're looking for opportunities. Um, we like to leg into things. We like to identify things. We sometimes like to be a little bit of a contrarian. Um, some recent examples of that are, are things like Ethereum Classic, 
um, that generally most of the digital currency community kind of left for dead when Ethereum Classic emerged um, after the DAO and, and the fork and the Ethereum blockchain. And you know, we started buying Ethereum at like Ethereum Classic at like 50 cents, um, and, and we had conviction and we stuck to it, and, and that trade worked out really well. Um, a new ecosystem that we're starting to get excited about is the confluence of um, virtual reality and digital currencies. Um, <laughs> And so there is a new project uh, called Decentraland um, that is a basically a decentralized platform where users and, and developers can create VR experiences and kind of in the wake of Facebook and Equifax and all these other hacks and centralized um, services and applications that we continue to use continue to kind of fail us or cause us to lose privacy. Um, we think it's conceivable that as VR continues to take off, there needs to be a robust, decentralized place, not only for development work, but also for people to actually take experiences through. Uh, and so Decentraland and the native currency mana is something that we're starting to get excited about as well. Wow, I haven't even heard of that. Yeah, and actually, we just did a screening this week. If any of you have read the book Snow Crash or Ready Player One, um, we as a company did a screening of Ready Player One this week, and it kind of shows this concept of this idea being the oasis, this virtual reality escape that everyone's kind of going to to um, escape reality, um, and where you can be anything and do anything and experience anything. Um, and so we're starting to see that perhaps a really great use case for digital currency is one area is VR, and maybe the two can get married, and some really good things can come out of that. Do you see that as an off shoot of the gaming ecosystem or? Definitely. Um, I mean, there's already digital currencies that focus on gaming, like game credits, and I don't even know how many others, but um, most certainly, uh, most certainly an offshoot of the gaming space. And um, looking more broadly at the choppy markets or choppy waters out there, um, how are you guys navigating that or what's going on right now? Because we had the mania, peak mania in December, we had $20,000 Bitcoin. And, you know, I mean, the market's lost two thirds of its value. Sure. Um, what's going on now? Have we hit bottom and what's going to happen next? So I will never predict prices. Um, <laughs> all I can tell this audience is I buy um, more Bitcoin for, for one, seven days a week. Um, I have that much conviction in the ultimate direction that Bitcoin is going um, that I personally am buying more Bitcoin every day. Um, I think one of the things that's- Were you buying it every day in December? Oh yeah, oh no, I've been buying it all the way up, buying it all the way down, I mean, that's, that's, that's what you do. Um, that that you, you dollar cost average into this, because um, I think that we're so early. We're maybe going from the first to the second inning in the life cycle of these assets. Um, and so for me, I've never been more excited about the space. Um, but I think one of the narratives that's really frustrating myself and my team, because we spend most of our time now with hedge funds and institutions, is that suddenly someone flipped the switch about six months ago. Um, and Fortune and Forbes and the Wall Street Journal and CNBC, and suddenly everybody's covering the space. Um, whether it's because it makes a great story or because great stories are transpiring, I'm not really sure. But somehow it became no longer taboo to be involved in the space, talk about the space, write about the space. And so what everybody is seeing and experiencing is digital currency everywhere. You can't pick up the popular press or turn on CNBC without seeing the Bitcoin price watch in the lower left hand corner. And the unfortunate result of that, even though the normalization of it, the demystification of it is important because it used to be quite unapproachable, the unfortunate result of all of that, all of those touch points is that everybody thinks everybody's involved and that everybody who's wanted to get involved has gotten involved. And I will be the first to let everyone know that that is not the case at all. Um, less than 1% of the world's population even owns some Bitcoin at the moment. Um, so most people have not gotten involved. Um, the hedge fund community, the institutional community is not meaningfully involved yet. Do you have digital currency focused hedge funds like Multicoin, right, that have strategies in the space, but traditional asset managers, traditional long short hedge funds, global macro funds, et cetera, the endowments, the foundations, the pensions, all of that institutional money is not in the space yet. Um, there's a couple reasons for it. Um, the pipes haven't been built. Um, which are some of the things that we're trying to invest in to help bridge those gaps, order management systems, custody solutions, quotations, a global order book, et cetera. Um, but the, the reason that a lot of that money is not in the space yet is because it's not big enough. A sovereign wealth fund can't get out of bed if they're not gonna write a $500 million check 
right? And if the space is only $250 billion of assets at the moment, you know, that's a really big ticket. Um, and so it wasn't until very, you know, much later on that a sovereign wealth fund would get involved in an Uber, right, until they're at that level. And so I like to try and tell people that there are still opportunities abound. Um, we've been raising money into our products at an exponential rate over the first quarter of this year. And this is one of those weird scenarios where a new asset has come along for the first time in a while. And because of the accessibility and the coin bases, et cetera, of the world, retail found their way into the asset class before institutions did. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but this price correction is a lot of those weak retail hands getting shaken out of the asset class um, or paying their tax bill. So um, that, that's kind of my purview of the world, but I'm sure you guys have some other thoughts so, as well. Has, uh, yeah, has the, the downturn affected your decisions or is it causing your portfolio companies to suffer? Not, I mean, not really. I, I think there, you know, there are certainly a few that are uh, involved in, in the direct, you know, gets affected by the market when people are, are selling or not as active, you know, the, um, the wallets and the um, exchanges. But um, in terms of the actual infrastructure and kind of enterprise, like the efficiencies I was talking about, those projects are actually, you know, they're, they're either going ahead or not. Like there's more clarity. Um, so there are a lot of proof of concepts that were happening in the enterprise like three years ago. And, and you know, these companies want to test for, for two years um, or so. And now we're getting clarity on what some of these use cases may be. So um, I, I'm actually more excited than ever on about the underlying technology as well as the crypto asset class. And I have to go back to what I said about venture. I, I, I also think, you know, venture has been an illiquid asset class for forever since it was created. And it's a t usually 10-year funds. And the ability to have some liquidity in the interim is actually very <laughs> exciting for a venture fund um, you know, to be able to, to manage or recycle capital in a way that we couldn't before. So I actually see opportunity, too, and not only, you know, not necessarily the death of, of DC, but a resurgence um, if, if the money is managed um, uh, or the liquidity is managed in the correct way. Um, so, and in terms of like Bitcoin and, and the, the assets, I agree. I think there's just a lot of people who got into this space because they looked, you know, they were watching CNBC and they were showing how to buy Ripple, uh, you know, at $3.50. I mean, my dad, who, you know, has been familiar with what I'm doing, you know, he called me up and he's like, oh, uh, you know, I finally know what you're up to. And I just saw it on CNBC. I'm going to go buy some Ripple. I was like, don't, please don't. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, and, and, and I'm pretty sure if he did buy it, he's probably sold it by now. And, and, and so I, I think there's a lot of that. Um, I, I think people only saw it going up, and that was the media story. And, and so people got in at the top, and then they, they just think it's over or it's not going to recover. Um, but but I, I'm a big long-term believer in, in a lot of these. Um, I think some of the smaller altcoins are, are very risky. And we don't know who. I mean, there are like 10 altcoins for like every single business model, so not all of them are going to survive. And, and so that, that's trickier, but I think in terms of the more blue chip ones, I'm, I'm a believer. Well, Matt, how about the hedge fund world? I mean, is this scary or is this just volatility you can make money off of? Yeah, so, so the, the benefit of being a hedge fund and as the asset management space around crypto kind of becomes more institutionalized, like what you have in traditional equities, like we do have the ability to make money in a down market, and so that is helpful. Um, and that's something that we are, are, are utilizing to our advantage. Um, and that's a benefit of liquidity and kind of venture style investing. But I think, I think you both hit it like right on the head. Like crypto is a very strange ecosystem where you, know, you have kind of natural sellers because people are providing a service to a network and they're getting paid for it and they have actual fiat dollar, you know, US dollar or whatever costs. Um, and so they need to be selling kind of assets. And you don't really have that in traditional equity. People are not you know, selling Apple stock because you know, they need to pay for bills for the most part. You know, maybe some hedge funds have redemptions and whatnot, but the only reason you're selling an asset is because you know, your cost of capital and the risk adjusted return that you're looking for doesn't match anymore. Um, so in crypto, you kind of have natural sellers. And so it's because you also have a lot of holders and people who believe in it, it's a very reflexive asset. And it's priced at the margin. And that's why we get the volatility that we have. So I think what we saw was retail coming in, you know, reading the New York Times about bros getting rich and being millionaires overnight. And it just kind of 
the hype cycle like took over. Like you're right, Michael. Like something happened, and like everyone was talking yeah, about it. Yeah, when CNBC has like 15 year olds <laughs> buying Lamborghinis, <laughs> yeah. it's like, Crazy. like it's, everyone's like, I can do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know, everyone's talking about Lambos and the moon, and you know, the price goes all the way to you know 20,000, and then it, it comes plummeting down because all these people frankly don't know you know what they're doing or what they're investing in, and and, and they're not really looking at it the right way. Um, and then you kind of have you know, another bucket that I see is kind of an OG kind of cypherpunks who have been in this forever, who are paper rich and now are kind of less paper rich. But either way, without new capital inflows, it's hard to drive prices higher. Um, and so they're, you know, they either don't have that or they're not putting it in because they're, they're paper rich. Um, and so really it comes down to institutions. And like a lot of the issues around institutions is custodial issues. Um, there's just fundamental issues that are preventing them from getting the exposure. Um, they're definitely interested, and they're looking at different ways to get exposure to the asset class. But you know, we really need a catalyst, kind of going forward, to to prop the market up as far as price price goes. And so I think institutional capital is one of them. I think regulatory clarity is the other. Um, I think there's obviously a regulatory overhang. I think people have been very cautious moving forward. I think um, you know the SEC has done a good job with soft power and hard power. Um, they've been weeding out bad actors. I think generally, you know, the frenzy that happened last year is, is not what we're seeing today. And I think that there's a lot of capital, like if you have a fiduciary responsibility to your LPs, you need a custodial solution. But also from a CYA perspective, like you don't want to invest when there's some sort of regulatory enforcement that could come out and crush you. Like if you really believe in the long-term visibility of this and you think that the upside is tremendous into the trillions of dollars, you'll pay twice as much on value to get that regulatory certainty. Or clarity. Yeah, I'm going to put my pessimist hat on for a sec because I think what we saw last year as well was um, these massive raises, like Tesla's, you know, 230 million. And smart ones did the ICO before the SEC came down, and you know they, they they're rich. And then a bunch of other people rushed in, and the plan was we're going to take the institutional money, you know, we're going to do uh, Reg D investment, have this all, and then we're going to go sell it to the retail suckers later on. But now it doesn't seem to be a way to you can't ICO anymore. And so it seems to me a lot of capital kind of clogged up in these useless tokens. That's my pessimist hat. Do you, do you feel that way, Michael? Um, I do. I mean, our business at Grayscale and DCG as our parent has by and large stayed away and out of the ICO ecosystem as a whole. Um, you know, I think as we look at a lot of, and we, we think we see almost every ICO that happens, um, but those that we don't, we're fine to pass those up as well. I think we, we've kind of found three things. I think one is kind of who's behind a given ICO. And oftentimes, when we don't see a, a track record of success by the entrepreneur doing something else besides this first ICO, that's kind of an immediate red flag for us. Um, two, we kind of look at the legality of it. Um, a lot of folks have, you know, tried to hire a fancy law firm or whatever it may be to create a SAFT or you know, some kind of regulatory framework that somehow qualifies their ICO as not being something that's illegal. But they're very much overlooking not only the primary issuance of the token and who's actually buying it, but actually the secondary trading of it and what kind of venue that's going to take place on. And so legality, I think, is another issue that probably weeds out almost 99% of them. Um, and then something that I'm sure hits home, certainly for you, is valuation. Um, and so when we are investing in entrepreneurs, and, and DCG is primarily a seed stage investor, you know, we're sometimes, right, like the first hundred or $200,000 into a given company. And, you know, they're doing this humble round. They have no business, they have a business model, I guess, or an idea, but no revenue, no employees, anything like that. And then when that same entrepreneur, that same team can take the same idea, you know, write a white paper, throw it out onto the internet, and say, here's our Ethereum address, send it in, and we'll send you tokens. Um, you know, and the valuation is 10 or 20 times as much. There's absolutely no reason why the valuation should be what it is through an ICO versus kind of in the traditional VC model. Um, and so what I was saying before we, we stepped out is, you know, we're certainly in favor of seeing the capital formation process become easier. We're trying to, you know, ha happy to see more people be able to participate in VC deals or liquid investments, but we're not necessarily sure that ICOs are going to be the way to do it. So for us, um, it is mostly been around those three items that's caused us to stay away. But aren't you worried at all if there is a huge ICO crack up and it all goes bust, that might contaminate the rest of the, the, the healthy crypto well, landscape? I think it'll obviously have one of the largest impacts on regular Ethereum, because regular Ethereum and a lot of the rise of Ethereum over the past year has primarily been fueled by the need for people to purchase Ethereum in order to participate in ICOs. And so if you did a 20, 30, 40, 100 million dollar ICO, received $100 million worth of Ethereum, and you weren't smart enough to move all of it into fiat, or at least a good portion of it, 
well, now your Ethereum or the money that you raised in order to go fund this project you had um, and give people this kind of promissory token, um, well, you're now really up, up the creek without a paddle, right? You're, 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 you've lost 60, 70% of your value. And for, for better or worse, the SEC is going to start cracking down on these ICOs more and more and may even revoke you know, rescission rights where they force an ICO issuer to actually return capital back to investors. And I doubt it's going to be in the form of Ethereum tokens. I'm sure it's going to be in the form of how much US dollars you've subscribed into the ICO. And you're going to have a major, major liquidity crunch on Ethereum and any of the other tokens that were used to raise capital. Um, could that have a spillover effect into other tokens and market sentiment? Sure. Um, but again, I think to one of the earlier points that was said, it's a lot of this SEC action is often trying to weed out bad actors and bad apples in the space to try and get it to be more mature. Oh, you two feel the same way? It's just going to contaminate what, what you're doing or the healthy parts or if the ICO stuff? Well, I think it's completely, it's the least surprising story. <laughs> um, I, I mean, given the scams and, and, and the, kind of the complete Wild West mentality of 2017, I, I mean, it was just a matter of time that uh, regulators were going to come in. I, I am surprised they haven't come down harder. <laughs> um, and and I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised at that. And I, I, I've seen, you know, with, from the SEC, the um, uh, FINMA, like all, all of the uh, regulators around the world have truly been trying to understand this, this kind of emerging asset class, trying to figure out is it a new asset class and, and how, you know, what's the best way to regulate it without uh, uh, stifling innovation. So I, I think, you know, we, we've had a, a fairly muted response given that, you know, all these issuances were happening like pretty much completely illegally <laughs> last year. And we didn't, um, we didn't participate in them just because I'm a fiduciary to my limited partners and I, I didn't know how I could You're justify sure, yeah. <laughs> investing in, in the, you know, and, 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 um, for me, also, if and, and we certainly do look at um, whether you know there there could be some business models where tokens make sense. But I, what I'm seeing is entrepreneurs are now raising equity rounds and and want to do the, those token issuances if it makes sense in in a more regulatory compliant way, um, and aren't you know afraid of giving up a, equity in, in in the beginning of that process. Yeah, I would say you know we're not. An ICO fund. We're not ICO flippers. Um, what's exciting about you know ICOs to me, at least, is the democratization of opportunity, both from a, an investing perspective as well as getting people on a global basis who are passionate about and can add the most value to a, a network or a protocol. Actually, being able to work on it and ignoring being able to work around kind of geographic proximity and constraints that traditional companies face. Um, but you know, as far as ICOs, the biggest problem for us is when you actually look at them, most tokens are not necessary. Um, and they're poorly constructed and designed. And they're frankly, you know, people were taking advantage of you know, the mania and the regulatory and you know, lack of regulatory certainty. And we're just kind of adding it on as a, as a, as a fundraising token and, in, and making it a proprietary payment token within the network, which creates friction for users. It's not really good for users at all. And if the thing actually works, and tremendous volume goes through it, the token can actually be so volatile, have such high velocity that it won't actually accrue any value. And so for us, ICOs, you know, as a, and DApps and, and this kind of token model is really, really interesting. But you actually, you know, you really have to approach it from a, from a fundamental basis and try and understand why will this accrue value if this token will accrue value. And so, you know, we've stayed away for a whole host of reasons like regulatory, et cetera, but a lot of them are just poor token, you know, poorly designed tokens that, that won't accrue value. Yeah. And I'm actually excited. I mean, I, I know you said this is an area you focus on, but securitization of like real world assets. And, and so that to me falls into the efficiency category. And then also, uh, you know, being able to offer asset classes uh, to a broader range of people than, than you know, like real estate and, and uh, other assets that weren't available to you know, the, the, the person sitting in Africa or India who can't even invest in, this, in, in, their, in, in the stock market. So, so that's an area I'm particularly excited about and I think could be like a segue before, I think in terms of the real, like the, the broader decentralization, I think there's a lot to be uh, figured out in terms of the economics and, and valuations, et cetera. And, and in, in the meantime, I think you know we can start getting there with with the securitization. Um, I've got some more questions, but we have about ten minutes left. I'm sure there's people in this room who might have some questions for our investors. Would anyone like to toss one out? Go ahead, sir. Uh, yeah, this goes for Matt. Um, so I read the one point blog post, the smart contract network. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's a great question, and it becomes an issue of, of what is the time horizon. Um, and yeah, over a long enough time period, you know, we expect a lot of different features and different trade-off designs um, for certain protocols to kind of converge. Um, but we're like very much in the early stages, like you guys have said. Like this is, you know, we're at the point where there's only one operating smart contract platform like in use today, and it's still, you know, an experiment unto itself. And so there are, you know, different protocols that are working on interoperability, things like Polkadot and Cosmos that are, you know, interesting, but. In the short term, they are very siloed, and until those protocols come out and can be proven in the open world, we won't really run into that. And so we think there's a tremendous opportunity in the, in the near term to think about you know, money in a different way. And we think a little contrarian, where we think money is kind of an emergent phenomenon. And just because an economist tells you, you know, gold is scarce, you should, you should own it, doesn't mean that people will necessarily listen to it. And so sometimes, you know, for us, there's an interesting path to you know, uh, uh, global money through actual utilization. And so if something is, if you can utilize something and it's part of a network like a, an Ethereum or something and it gives you access to all these dApps, uh, you'll hold more of it because it's more useful to you. And that in itself kind of becomes money. So over the long run, there's going to be a lot of probably convergence. But in the short run, there's a lot of different protocols that are making very different design trade-offs that are going to attract very fundamentally different developers and different user base. Do I see another hand out there? Um, I think uh, you're next, sir. Uh, so I guess this is still related to value accretion, I guess. But um, how do you think about the right model for incentivizing founders to keep building? Right. So when you're talking about open source protocol, the ability to form anything with any type of rent seeking, uh, what's, what model do you think makes sense that goes you know, maybe towards a percentage of block rewards going to founders, like a Zcash, uh, vesting, <coughs> for example? Yeah, I think I think it's a combination. Frankly, um, I think you know traditionally in, in equities, you know, we've always looked at um, vesting over time. I think time is fairly arbitrary. It doesn't really incentivize people to you know build something. It incentivizes them to kind of stay around. And so the ability to kind of have um, some sort of founder's reward based on utilization and usage of the actual protocol is really an interesting way to kind of mold both of them. And so I think we'll see more ideas like that that are kind of in disparate places now converge and we'll find a better kind of model going forward. The idea of raising all of your capital at once in an ICO is, is foolish and then from an investor's perspective like that is really risky and that's you know there's there's going to be as the investor community matures you know people will mitigate that against that risk in, in different kind of stages like we the see last in Michael do you want to weigh in on the how to incentivize platform developers? Yeah, I, I think this is you know to be determined. Um, I still I, I do believe in investing. I, I think time you know like some of these things take time to build and and yeah some combination probably makes sense. But I, I wouldn't like dismiss the value of of you know the vesting that we've created. It's 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 worked. Um, I mean, I actually even think of longer term vesting, you know, versus the four years. And, and in, in equity deals, I mean, uh, we, we've seen five year, you know, time horizons um, emerge just because, I mean, that's how long it takes to build something. And, sure. and you want to make sure people stick around to do that. Yeah, I totally agree with that comment. I would also just say that there's, a, there's an impatience um, that is, is mounting, um, not just between us as humans and, and kind of the world and lives that we that we lead, but also because of how fast this asset class is growing, particularly for these entrepreneurs and these founders, I think it's even more pronounced. Um, so like, for example, we're an investor in Zcash, right? And we love the team. It's a great team of scientists. We think the founder's re reward is a really interesting model, but it's not something that's necessarily been time tested yet, right? So we'll see how it plays out. Um, you know, other models that maybe we disagree with a little bit more are things like Ripple, where the company owns the still the lion's share of the XRP tokens, 
you know, for us, that's kind of an investor overhang, or it could be an investor overhang, right? Um, and, and them kind of moving into the system of locking up a lot of that XRP such that it can only be unlocked, you know, a certain amount each month or each quarter um, and have some kind of treasury system, you know, that's another way to kind of ensure that the right protocols and procedures are in place to keep them aligned with the goals of the business, or the goals of their network, or the goals of their token. Um, so these are all kind of new and interesting concepts, and we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. Yeah. Um, go ahead, please. Yeah, so as far as traditional kind of the ways that we kind of hedge risk and things like that, we are using um, their infrastructure still being developed, but we do have the ability to short. Um, we do have the ability to borrow certain tokens. It's limited right now. There's, you know, it's hard to get borrows on, you know, really obvious things that we would love to short that are much smaller market cap, but things like BTC and ETH, et cetera, is pretty easy to, to get our hands on. Um, there's also options, at least on Bitcoin, um, that, we, that we've looked at as far as derivatives, um, you know, out of the money calls, et cetera. Um, and as far as your second question was on was on alpha, I think what you're seeing now is I think what you will see is a f kind of a flight to quality. Like yes, everything is down, but when you actually look, the market is irrational, right? And so when you actually look at the fundamentals of what all of these protocols are doing, they're actually very different from one another. Like Bitcoin going for digital, you know, sovereign kind of, you know, digital gold is very different from being a computational resource in Ethereum. Those are fundamentally different use cases, and the fact that they kind of trade together, I think, is just the the result of a nascent market. Um, and so I think being able to pick the right um, assets over time that have the best kind of ecosystems around them and the fundamentals supporting them, I think will generate alpha. And I think you'll see a lot of coins that don't matter. Um, and you'll see a flight to quality out of them. And so some bigger assets that make sense are down, but they're down a lot less than some of these like smaller altcoins that didn't well, make sense to You're the giving the market a lot of credit. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I think we can slip in two more quick questions. Uh, please go ahead and then you after. Um, we in, did you invest in CryptoKitties? Oh, so we invested in CryptoKitties um, alongside some other really seasoned investors like USV and I forget who else participated in the round. I wasn't personally involved in the deal. I think a lot of the, um, does everyone know what a CryptoKitty is? Can everyone raise your hand if you know what CryptoKitties are? No. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> who owns one? <laughs> yeah, who owns a CryptoKitty? And who wants to buy one? <laughs> yeah, there we go. We're open for trading. Um, so, um, you know, I think it, it's, it's starting to be around tokenization of unique assets. It's playing into gaming. I think there's a lot of different aspects um, of it. You know, there's, um, I think Dogecoin, like the, the, the Shiba Inu died or something today or something like, or, or, some, or something like that. You know, like there, there's other things and they sound like a farce, but they actually have an impact. Um, so the CryptoKitties deal specifically though, um, again, I think it has to do with gaming, tokenization of assets, um, securitization of, of, of like real world assets, but these are kind of intangible, obviously. Um, and we'll, we'll see what happens. I think, you know, people flipping their CryptoKitties for like, $18,000, like, I think, do I think that's insane? Yeah, I think that's insane. Um, and, and this kind of harkens back to like, do you remember Tamagotchis, yeah. right? Does everyone remember what a Tamagotchi is? Like you have this, this little pet that you're supposed to take care of. Um, but these are serious projects that people are really getting excited about. So again, not time tested, really early, and that's why we're a small kind of early investor in projects like it. Great, and last question. Solving those blockages that are keeping institutional investors who want to invest. 
Yeah, I mean, custody is definitely one. If you look at um, just analytics around, um, you know, right now, <laughs> Figuring out what to custody, you know how how liquid to keep your your um, your coins and 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 like moving them around. I mean that that like takes a lot of time and analytics and and I've invested in a company that's kind of automating that as well as as working towards automating uh, trade execution um, around different parameters that you set. So um, I, I, I'm particularly interested in in kind of the algo version <laughs> of, of, of crypto asset trading. Um, and I, I feel like it's all low-hanging fruit. I mean, you guys do this. On yeah, the right yeah. I mean, like you have companies like TradeBlock that have an order management system and this whole great series of indices that people can use, right? But then a platform like Coinbase has its own indexes, its own you know trading software, et cetera. Um, you have Omniex, which is coming out now, which is a whole trading platform as well. You have, I think, the inability at the moment as an institution who trades equities and ETFs and bonds and CDS and uses DVP accounts and, and is part of the DTC system, these assets do not fall into any of those pipes at all. Um, so order management systems don't go out eight decimal places the way Bitcoin does, right? And so my view, and, and probably a lot of people who are, in venture, who are investing on the venture side of a lot of these businesses and trading tools, are that the big banks, the big institutions are not going to be building this stuff, but rather all these trading tools are going to be acquisition targets. Um, you know, will you eventually be able to submit a ticket through Bloomberg because you just did a big Bitcoin block trade? Yeah, I think that day is coming. Absolutely. Um, there's no question about it it. Um, but we're, are we there yet? No, we're not. And I think that all of these tools today are starting to have proofs of concept. You're starting to see licensing going out to a lot of the banks, a lot of the institutions so they can experiment with them, give them feedback. But they're buggy and, and they're new and they're also reliant often on APIs that don't always work with exchanges all over the world that have outages or DDoS attacks, etc. Again, the consistent message I think that we've all been kind of giving throughout this panel is that it's new, it's nascent, there's bugs, it's, it's exciting, but it's also very risky. And I think that's you know very true uh, for institutional involvement as Just well. Just to wrap up, I'd like to finish on an up round, uh, and so let's make it a lightning round. What's going to be the the big thing at the end of this year? You can reflect for a second, but just very quickly, what's going to be big at the end of 2018? Can I go last? <laughs> <laughs> and you don't um, have to be right. I'm. I mean, I'm excited about the enter. I mean, this is going to be so boring and unsexy, but enterprise um, mm -hmm. applications starting to emerge. Um. Yeah, I was going to say. I think a lot of the big banks whose CEOs I won't name, who have either been kind of speaking negatively about the space, saying they're going to fire people if they do things in the space, et cetera, <laughs> yeah, are going to be retracting more and more of those comments, opening themselves up more to more um, proof of concept and, and other applications for themselves because they're realizing this isn't going to go away. Um, and when these companies either start going public in the space and they start seeing how much market share these other folks are getting, you're going to have a snowball effect across the online discount brokerage firms, um, the wire houses, and ultimately the big banks. Um, whether that happens fully in 2018, I'm not sure, but you will definitely start to see the beginnings of it. Enterprise banks and Matt, take us home. I would say some sort of regular, uh, regulatory clarity. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, but it's, it's got to be something that kind of gives us some sort of bar um, where we're, you know, can can definitively say that everyone over that bar is acting, you know, in good faith. And there are a lot of people that are trying to bend over backwards to fit new technology into old frameworks. And I think that there's a lot of capital on the sidelines that's waiting for that. But I also the new think, rules of the game will bring yeah, us all in. I also think there's a lot of talent on the sidelines too. People with great jobs at Google that can launch something but don't want to jump in with, the, with that sort of risk. I think there's going to be a lot of talent that comes into the into the ecosystem and all the innovation that, that drives is really exciting. Great. Sounds promising. Uh, please, everyone, let's give our panel a hand.